my name's Emma. Um, I am the operations associate at Ars Lyrica, and I decided to call this uh, roundtable of young artists, um, people who are my friends and colleagues, and who represent a huge swath of different arts jobs um, and disciplines. So I have six different people here. Um, who are going to introduce themselves and then we're going to chat a little bit about our connections with each other, about what we've done in the field, about what we would love to do in the arts, and then about the things that we could do together. So let's start with Dylan Beckman, um, who I met through a mutual hobby of Ultimate Frisbee. Dylan, take it away. I'm Dylan. Um, I'm a photographer. I grew up in Houston, Texas, went to school in Connecticut, bounced back to Houston where I met Emma. Now I'm in New York, but moving to New Haven for grad school next week. <laughs> um, so I've been all over the place lately, but uh, in the last three years since graduating college, I've held a myriad of different arts jobs, uh, starting as an exhibitions intern at the Houston Center for Photography, which is a nonprofit. Um, then I was a high school photography teacher for about six months. Then after that, I went and took pictures of sheep in the UK and sheared some sheep. Then I was an intern at a gallery here in New York. And then I was an assistant for a sculptor. And then I designed frames at this photo lab. Um, now I'm going to grad school for art. Um, um, to say. <laughs> and then also you worked at a cheese shop, is that oh, correct? Yeah, not really applicable to this, but I do know more about cheese now. Um, but yeah, I have I knew I wanted to work in the arts, have taken the last few years to kind of absorb a lot of experience and have learned a lot. Great to see you all. Uh, I'm Ben, I grew up in Chicago. Uh, where I am currently right now, sitting in my parents' basement, and uh, went to school in Los Angeles for cello. Um, loved cello, decided it was like probably not the thing I wanted to do for the rest of my life. Um, tried conducting, went to more school for conducting in Houston, uh, which is where I met Emma. Um, and then after a couple years at Rice, uh, I got a job um, working for the Houston Grand Opera as a conductor. Um, so I have just sort of finished my first season there, it was sadly truncated. Um, but yeah, so now I'm, I'm back in Chicago. Um, I'm going to be here for, for the next little while. Hi, uh, my, my name is Yvonne and I, um, I play viola. I went to Rice for both my undergrad and grad degrees in viola performance um, and uh, have been in Houston now for the past, uh, coming up on 11 years. Um, I play, um, also a big part of what I do is playing uh, Baroque viola. So I have, um, I love playing music in the way that composers like Bach and Mozart would have heard it played on the instruments that they would have been familiar with. Um, I. I get to sub with the Houston Symphony, Houston Grand Opera, and Houston Ballet, but I also play with Ars Lyrica, um, and uh, I run my own chamber music group called La Speranza, where we um, have, where we play chamber music on period instruments, and I also play with a group called American Box Soloists in San Francisco. Um, I met Emma through Rice, but got to know her better over the last year as we worked kind of together, Ars Lyrica and La Speranza. My name is Holing, and I'm originally from Hong Kong, and I'm currently in Los Angeles. Um, I'm working as a composing assistant for Harry Gregson Williams, who, have, who is a very prolific composer and has done a lot of films. And I went to school in Chinese University of Hong Kong, and I study piano performance and uh, compo composition. And at that time, I didn't actually know composing for a living was an option. But um, yeah, after graduation, I just started teaching piano and doing a little bit of composing gigs on the side. 
And um, I found out there was actually um, a profession and a career to do music for film and TV and for different media. So I decided to go for it. And I, um, I went to a film scoring program in Berkeley, Valencia, and I really loved it. And yeah, that's how um, I started um, doing this uh, profession and um, eventually led me to come to LA for an internship. And um, yeah, so now I am in a really good place and I'm really enjoying it. Hi everyone, my name is Sydney. Um, I handle all communications for Fresh Arts. My main role is like being the social media manager. Um, so I went to undergrad here. I could say I was born and raised in Houston. I put in my bio that I kind of was born and raised like in Kima. So I can't really claim Houston, but it's all one big. Houston's like very large. Um, yeah, so I went to undergrad here. I went to U of H Clear Lake, got my degree in marketing. Um, and so I've always had a thing for like fashion and styling. So I moved to New York, which was only supposed to be for the summer. I interned at Paper Magazine, ended up staying for close to two years. Um, so I did a bunch of freelancing for like Patty Wilson, who's like the editor at large for Vogue Italia. Um, I did freelance for styling for um, free people. And then I also worked at W and Marie Claire magazine as a fashion and accessories assistant. So I did that. Um, and while I was doing that, I was trying to get my MBA at the same time, but I was just, you know, I'm not a business savvy person. I did marketing because that was to please the parents. Um, I really wanted to go to art school. So I was like, I can't do this. And I found out that my school had a digital media marketing program. Um, and so, however, I couldn't compete that while I was living in New York. So I moved home to finish that. So I just graduated with my master's degree in digital media um, this past May. So that's really exciting. Um, so how I ended up at Fresh Arts was my capstone course. I needed kind of a graduate internship um, and they called me and they needed help and I just never left. So I'm now with Fresh Arts. <laughs> uh, yeah, my name is Sam. Uh, I'm a violinist and I was uh, raised in Phoenix, Arizona. So I, yeah, I was pretty, pretty much a lot of place, places for school. Uh, I went I went to Cleveland, uh, New York for my master's before coming to Rice as a current doctoral student. Uh, right now I am uh, part of the Kinetic Ensemble, which is how I met Emma. And uh, I'm also currently adjunct faculty uh, for violin at Lone Star Community College. Cool. Um, so now I'm gonna ask a non-musical question for all of you. Uh, because I guess non-arts, because we're not all in music. Um, and I will have to change my language for that because it is so cool for me to get to work with non-musician arts people. I think that's going to be so fun. Um, so my question is, uh, if you could be absolutely amazing at a totally non-arts related career, barring talent, barring money, barring anything, what would it be? Um, does builder count? I guess that's kind of creative or like craftsman. That's cool. Uh, what would you build? Um, I've always like appreciated really well-made furniture. And I think I love woodworking, but I'm not very good at it. Mm. I feel like that's art adjacent. Besides that, I would maybe be like an EMT or a paramedic or something. That's a great answer. Okay, Ben. Um, I have this like super random dream where I'm like an amazing math professor. <laughs> I know that's, uh, that's pretty random. Um, I always loved math, like loved taking math classes in high school and stuff. I know it's super weird. Um, and then I went to a college where you literally could not take a math class if you wanted to. Um, and so like, I love that. And the idea of like being like in a learning university type place, I love. Um, so yeah, that's, <laughs> that's that. Love it, love it. Okay, what about you, Yvonne? Um, probably, I mean, I, I really like writing. Like I, I love writing, but I know that's kind of artsy, but I would, um, a non-arts job I would like is a uh, first responder or um, a SWAT officer. That would be like, that would be pretty cool. Whoa, that's awesome. Um, that's, I mean, and people who know me in real life would like be so shocked, but, um, <laughs> but yeah, 
like barring anything I would that would be a cool job to have I think oh my god cool um I can't remember if Holing or Sydney was next so let's go Holing and then Sydney and then Sam I think I would really love to be a chef I grew up with a lot of amazing Asian food and I have a passion for eating. I guess many people do. Um, and even like just now as a hobby, I like cooking a lot. And I like, exper like experimenting with different flavors and different cuisine. And I think it would be pretty amazing to be a good chef. Yeah, that'd be so cool. I wish I was good at cooking. <laughs> but maybe one day I will be. I can share some recipes with you. <laughs> yes, please. That would be awesome. <laughs> Uh, Sydney. Um, mine's going to be very similar. I've always loved like pastries. Um, so I don't want to be a pastry chef. I was in my school's like culinary program. Um, so I was really hardcore about wanting to be like a cake decorator. I worked at like a cupcake shop in high school and like I had a small job as being a cake ball decorator like in between when I was like switching jobs. Um, so I love, I feel like that's still the arts because I think that's why I gravitated towards it so much because I'm like decorating cupcakes and stuff. But definitely I would want to be like a top notch like pastry chef in Paris. I follow way too many pastry chefs on Instagram. It's the, oh man, I look, I've been eating way too many sweets and it's so funny because I can't cook to save my life. I can make desserts, but like food wise, like I'm still, I can ground some like turkey meat and like make some tacos. That's all I can eat, but like I can make any type of pastry. <laughs> okay, maybe Ho Ling can just like send some recipes to all of us. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure, I'd love to share. Definitely. Perfect. Um, okay, and lastly, Sam. Uh, yeah, uh, this is kind of like a random dream of mine, and I don't know if I'd be good at it at all, at all but, you know, I wouldn't mind being like a marine biologist, you know, just, uh, yeah, I had a really amazing biology uh, teacher back in high school, so that he kind of piqued my curiosity about uh, marine life, so just, uh, un you know, knowing that there's is so much unknown that we, you know, yeah, that we still don't know about the ocean. That's, for me, that's kind of exciting for me. Oh, that's so cool. That'd yeah. be awesome. I feel like um, when I think marine biologist, I'm like, and you get to swim with dolphins, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so let's kind of get into the discussion part of this round table. Um, and start talking about the arts. So I would love for you guys to just like jump in. I know that's a little bit hard on Zoom, but once you're done with your thought, you can just like stop talking and then the next person can go a couple seconds later. Um, so I wanna start by asking all of you guys, what do you love about working in the arts and what do you want to change about working in the arts? Um, so dual sided question. And if you have like an immediate answer, you can just go for it. For me, I think just like starting out in the arts when I was really young, um, I really gravitated towards it. So I feel like I've come for a full circle where I like went, started out like wanting to go to art school, then like went into fashion and now I'm like, I'm back working in the arts community in Houston. I think what I love most about it in a weird way, and I feel like it's a double edged sword, um, my team is amazing. I love them. The group of people that we service or cater to in Houston, um, it's a far range of artists from different mediums. Um, but it's also, I think, I would love for it to be more inclusive. And when I say inclusive, probably more so like the people who run our boards, more just like a different diversity. Because the team and the staff are diverse, we're in it, we're like getting our hands wet. But just like I would say a more inclusive culture. Because I feel like for me, like, when I worked in the gallery before I moved to New York, I didn't see a lot of people who looked like me. Um, so that I always felt somewhat out of place, but I, I found my voice after moving to New York, but I would just say like more inclusivity. Uh, for me, uh, what I value most about my art is the element of uh, community and collaboration, uh, being perpetually inspired by other people's music making. And, you know, music played an early role in my life because it, it was a way for me to be able to relate, to connect to others, um, especially as someone who at various points of my, my childhood uh, had a harder time making friends. So, you know, making music in orchestra or string quartet 
was my way of having an incredible shared experience. And so, you know, yeah, so collab collaboration was and continues to be very important to me. Um, it's something that I prioritize in my music making. Um, one specific thing that, yeah, you know, I wish I can change about at least my field, uh, the classical music field, is that it's very expensive to be a classical musician. And that really does have huge ramifications in terms of wealth and racial disparity in our music community. But yeah, you have to really invest a lot of money. And that's even before you get into conservatory, which is, you know, easily, you know, uh, $55,000 per year, uh, you know, in tuition. And that's not even, you know, that, yeah, you're investing that money into a career that is not inherently lucrative. Um, yeah, so, yeah, for me, uh, the amount of money that we have to put in really creates huge problems in so many ways. I, I can really relate to Sam in many ways because I also was a very quiet kid when I grew up and I didn't really know how to communicate with other people. So music is kind of a way for me to make friends and, you know, express my feelings. And I really love creating an art because it feels like it's almost like your baby. You put so much time and dedication into it. And when it comes out, it's, there is like a big satisfaction that goes with it. And um, I always have wanted to create art that could, you know, make one person feel good about it. And, or maybe if it touches their heart, then that's like my ultimate goal of writing a piece of music. And um, uh, regarding about like what I want to change about this field, I think I, I share a very similar view with Sydney. Um, in the composition view in film music, there are very little, um, you know, people of di diversity, like there are very little women in the industry, I haven't really seen a lot of women in on top of the industry. There may be more working on indie, indie films, but on like big studio features, I almost have never seen any women composers. But I think the industry is starting to change a little bit uh, within recent years. I think it's a very good thing. But um, we still have a lot of work to, to do. And um, I think it's very important to get different races to be represented and to have more women in the industry in general. I mean, I think something that's, that's probably true across the board of, of all of our arts um, is that even though we think of artists in general as being these very, uh, you know, sort of open-minded liberal kinds of people, the arts themselves are, are really conservative. Um, and it's so hard, you know, to, to make a difference or change anything about your art uh, unless you sort of go through the the normal, like, correct way of doing it. Um, so I think sort of, you know, to Sydney's point about inclusivity, uh, something that I have, have seen and taken part in that made a huge difference um, is, like, really, like, taking music to people who, who otherwise would never see a live orchestra, a live string quartet, you know, like, like, I've literally, you know, set up an orchestra in a third grade cafeteria. Um, because I know for me and probably for all of you, there was that moment when you're like a little kid, when you see that person doing the thing and you're like, oh my God, that's, I, I wanna do that. Um, and everyone needs to have that opportunity to have that, that you know, like eureka moment. Um, but then I think also really uh, to what Sam was saying, after you have that moment, uh, especially classical music, and I don't doubt it's true for, for all the arts, is just so like prohibitively expensive to be good at. Um, and so uh, maybe this can be sort of an open question is like, if you're that, you know, that six year old who sees the person playing the violin and you see yourself doing that, but you're not in a position where, where your family, you know, it, uh, is privileged enough to, to get you those lessons, uh, how can we, empower that student to still go with what they want to do. I mean, one of the organizations that was really helpful to me as a, um, as a young violist, um, I mean, my family, we didn't have, um, you know, we, we, it, it, we had, we went through some rough times um, 
around my formative years and uh, this organization called Sphinx um, that helps, uh, that is there for um, people of color, basically, um, of, of black and um, Latino descent. Um, and like give scholarships to music programs. They have a competition, which I was a part of. Like investing in programs like that, I think is, has really helped me like as a young musician have opportunities and just see what's possible like because often you know we don't see people that look like us in orchestras or or as soloists and they're at the convention that they have like um just incredibly amazing people um conductors composers soloists um, orchestra musicians um that are all that look like me and it's it was a transformative experience so i mean i can't say what's good for every person of color but that really was um uh transformative for me as a young person um i love uh, like one of the things i love about working in the arts like like uh, sam and um holding you said is just the community that i get to be a part of um especially again as a quiet kid growing up um, just to have that kind of um, uh, camaraderie and like a family I mean it is it can be so much like a family um, I guess one of the things I'd like to change about the arts is that feeling of not feeling like you can speak up or be honest because you might you know lose what you have and I know that's not just specific to the arts but just I'd want to change the way we communicate with each other um, outside of our art form, just being able to listen and um, be honest with each other about what we'd like to do differently without fear of losing our jobs. I resonate with a lot of what you guys have said already. I think one thing that I love about working in the arts and having worked at a bunch of different places in the last few years is learning from people and people who come from different educational backgrounds and cultural backgrounds and life experiences they all bring what they've learned and you get to learn from them or you learn about new artists or new movements or whatever it is and i found that really great i don't like the artists i like now are probably because other people have shown them to me not because i learned about them in school or something traditional um and then similarly something i would change in addition to inclusivity, I think accessibility is really important. Um, I remember growing up going to the Houston Contemporary Arts Museum and not understanding what the exhibit was about. I don't know if that's more of like a visual thing, just visual arts thing, but like highly conceptual art that only like really educated, high brow art people will understand. I feel like there's a lot of that. and. I wish there were more movements to sort of make art something that anyone can walk in and take away something from or understand or resonate with to a certain degree. And also I would change unpaid internships because I think kind of like Ben and Sam were saying like, you have to either sacrifice a lot and go live in New York and work somehow survive there unpaid or I don't know, you need to pay a bunch of money to get up in the world, which that's not fair. I think that um, Dylan, what you were saying about accessibility, I, I feel it so much, not only in modern music, which is like a big monster to talk about in itself, but also in visual art, I remember going to the Rothko Chapel for the first time and knowing that it was like a really great meditative experience, but then looking at the paintings on the walls and being like, I don't get it. Oh God, what's going to happen? <laughs> um, but then I also have had experiences, like I saw an exhibit at the CAM by a visual artist who I think died in his 30s or 40s, but ended up like he was a young person, visual artist, and he had the most hilarious paintings that he he would put like a little like Spider-Man and then like the Virgin Mary and then he would put them together and and 
there is so much that you can get out of that, but you can also say, oh, Spider-Man, I know that guy. That makes it more accessible. And I think that it's so cool that kind of, I think younger people are learning to integrate their like casual on the street experience with their education and come up with these like really weird uh, concepts that blend the two in super interesting ways. How do you think this pandemic will influence your artistic medium? Um, I think that it's, I mean, like speaking to what everyone was saying about accessibility, like I think it actually, um, I mean, it definitely changes that kind of accessibility. For some people it might, like with, with the group that I, pl I run, we play in Houston, so it's not like, like there are video, we don't usually like stream our concerts. I mean, we didn't before this, but now we're able to reach more people not in Houston. Um, and we can kind of like modify our concert where we're doing monthly streamed concerts next season where we might meet together to record in a socially distanced way, or we might, it's just, uh, or like putting together duos or trios or solos. Um, it's varied, so it's it's definitely changing our, our medium as we get to be more flexible and um, get to potentially reach more people. But obviously, that depends on if those people have an internet connection. So there's you know mixed mixed different sides to the accessibility question. But overall, we we just get to be even more flexible than we already are, just based on what art form you know the the type of art form that we have. I think the pandemic question is is probably a question that's going to be like super different for different art forms. Um, I personally am hopeful that in the world of opera, it will not change things. Um, that may be a, a fool's hope, but um, I, you know, I think there's something so like unique about, about the liveness of it. Um, and there's something also really uh, uh, special about in the opera world, the thing I love most is that in order to put on, you know, any kind of remotely decent opera performance, you need so many people who do so many different things to all work on it. And that is so beautiful. Um, and I don't think that that is replaceable in a virtual setting, or at least I sincerely hope it's not. Um, but I wanted to also uh, ask, uh, based on what Dylan was saying, which I was just thinking about, um, about, and also you, Emma, um, about accessibility, because it's such an issue, uh, especially in uh, contemporary classical music and in probably a variety of other art forms as well. Um, but there's so many people who are creating art who feel the need to like push that art in a new way um, and to like go someplace no one has, no, no one has gone before. Um, and so the way that manifests itself is frequently in art that's like totally incomprehensible to 99% of the population. So how can we balance these things? Um, like how can we not create the same art that's been made for 300 years, but also like make it in a way that people can actually understand it? Dylan, do you want to address that one? <laughs> that's a tricky question. I feel like I was reading this weird theory thing about postmodernism, and it just reminded me of that about how like basically everything in postmodernism is like turning everything from the modern area era and like Victorian art on its head and like trying to rebel against it. And I feel like now we're in like post postmodernism where we're making like stuff that's only about ideas about art. And like, there was some line in this text that was about like, all art has already been made. And it really freaked me out and I had to stop reading it. Cause I just, I don't know don't like to think about oh god <laughs> you sent me that link though i'd love to read that um i forgot who it was by Ugh. yeah i'll just right. come and i want to see that too okay right. <laughs> here, here. Here thought, though. but i think that that's a tough question to answer i would say like looking at accessibility from a non-profit perspective i think this pandemic has influenced how we go about putting our, on our events. So I would say this pandemic has been like a blessing and a curse. I say blessing very lightly because um, it's hard times at the moment, but it's also like we've had to really hone in on 
okay, so we're putting on these virtual events, our summit's coming up, that's about to be all virtual, which last summer it was in person. So it's like accessibility talking about in the way of how can we help those artists who experience marginalization? Um, so those who are like hard of hearing, those who are blind. So it's also like making sure all of our virtual um, events that we put on, we always have the captions on, but then also Houston is a melting pot. People speak a majority of Spanish. So it's also like, do we need an interpreter? Then also hard of hearing, we're going to need to have someone who can sign on these Zooms as well. So everyone feels inclusive. Um, so I think that's been a really, we're really trying to focus in on that, but also with nonprofits, it's like you need that grant money because that's expensive to pay a signer and then to have a translator. So we're just really trying to figure out um, how we can go about really shifting and it's for the better. And I'm really like excited about it because that's become our like main project as well as with everything else that's going on. So it's really making sure that we're helping those artists who have been marginalized, who have never felt like they were part of the arts or you know, always have to be like, oh, is this accessible? Um, so speaking of accessibility from that standpoint. I think that the, the marriage of the two questions, like the pandemic question and the accessibility question is like an interesting direction to go because I think that when there's so much virtual content available now, um, like I know at least in music and I, and I actually just got an email from the MFA and they were doing a, you know, an online exhibit with so much saturation on the market. We have to be able to make people interested in what we're doing. And I think that that's a very 21st century arts problem, um, that they don't really teach us about in school. And I know that there have been some professors uh, at Rice who have their students talk before every recital so that they can kind of get the person to person connection. But I think that the more, um, the more abstract our art is, to some extent, the more explanation it'll require, or at least the more um, like, bringing people in and like giving them a hug before they get to the, you know, scary out there art. Um, and even, you know, even if it's a thing where, for instance, if I would say, I have this piece of music and I just want you to listen to it. And I don't have an agenda for you, but if you could just listen and then feel what you want. Even me saying that to you, I think is a kind of permission for the layman to be able to better understand what we're trying to show them. Um, and requires, you know, some description, which I know is, to your point, Ben, not maybe what all artists want. But I think in a world where everything is readily available, we have to make it worth people's while and we have to make them feel like we want them to be viewing our art. Definitely. I think it's so, I'm glad that you touched on that because as Dylan said, like when she went into a museum and just kind of like walked out, like I don't quite understand. Like there's still some exhibits like pre-pandemic um, that I walked in and I was like, what? I'm not catching on here. And then you go into their bio and you're trying to learn more about this artist. And I'm like, you have so many layers and everyone has their different creative process, but it's so deep and I'm like I'm just so lost I don't know if I'm supposed to like understand exactly what this piece is but I kind of like how some artists can go about just I'm making this because I want to it's for you to interpret it how you interpret it it's not supposed to be this is what you're supposed to feel like that type of art I feel like is just not modern and it needs to we need to evolve past that but I like the leaving it up to the public to get whatever type of feelings they get from viewing it so maybe it's so maybe it's like, you know, because I think at least in in music, there's this idea of like the music should either should or does like always speak for itself, mm -hmm. and that's all the information you need. And maybe we just need to like reframe our our ideas about that in general as like maybe that's true sometimes, but it's okay if it's not true, yeah. and it's okay if the creator you know needs to tell you something about it. That's fine. Yeah. Or just mm -hmm. contextualize it in some way whether it's like the historical or like just some sort of like context and it can be vague or as detailed as 
someone wants. I want um, Holing's ideas on this because I have gone through entire movies where I was so like so into the plot itself that I didn't even hear the music the first time. It was just like it was just part of it, you know. Um, and then I would have to go back and be like, "Wait, the music did something. I'm sure it did. What was it?" So I guess in a field where it's not as much about accessibility as it is about like blending all of the different art forms together. Yeah, uh, totally. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I think with film music, um, like it really shouldn't like stand out, like because it serves the purpose of the film. It has to serve the purpose of the storytelling and it's not supposed to be intrusive. Um, it's supposed to be helping with the plot and helping with how the story is going. And I think it's actually very great if you don't really notice the music. Um, like sometimes it has to like come out to, you know, like, because there are so many things that couldn't really be, uh, it like, uh, how, how should I say it? Like for some, some emotions, it couldn't really be portrayed just with words or with the dialogues or with, uh, other aspects so it's important for those moments to have the music to chime in and you know give the audience a certain feeling and yeah uh, regarding like the pandemic question i think if anything probably more people are currently watching more movies and tv shows than ever because everyone's stuck at home and they don't have anything else to do um but uh, the thing is that like now productions is kind of slowed down a little bit because we are not allowed to shoot anymore. So I know it's been a little difficult for our industry, but uh, for me personally, I only have gotten more time to compose mm -hmm. because we, it's always kind of like a, a, a half joke in our industry that to say that like we compose is almost never come out of the cave and the pandemic kind of like fits into our lifestyle. Yeah, but um, I think um, now we don't really see uh, the effect of the pandemic yet because we still have a lot of content going into post-production, but it's definitely kind of a, like a little damaging to the industry for sure. And then Sam, I wanna bounce to you too um, and ask about what Kinetic has been doing and how it's been to create music in those little like squares that appear in like one person playing violin and then you get the second violinist up here um and how that process has been and if it's been enjoyable uh and what what is different from that versus like live performance oh um it's been quite a learning curve uh to do it and it's definitely not something that you know we feel like can replace live music um, it's, you know, realizing, first of all, it takes significantly more time editing than to actually, you know, pl uh, play the music and, and, you know, and put it together. Um, yeah, and well, doing this, while it's been helpful for, you know, uh, for our artistic creativity during these tough times, you know, it really makes us realize how much we miss each other's collaboration. Um, and especially speaking personally as a violinist, uh, you know, you know, we violinists tend to be divas because, you know, we have the melody <laughs> a lot of the time. So, you know, if, if because we, we, we are divas, we take for granted, you know, um, the harmony, the structure, context, um, you know, sharing our melodies with others. We, you know, we take that for granted. And without that, you know, as violinists alone, we're, we're kind of bland, <laughs> we're kind of meaningless. So it's, you know, it, it, so yeah, uh, uh, the pandemic and, you know, even despite doing all these, um, you know, cool virtual things, it, yeah, I, it really puts into relief how much you, yeah, uh, how important collaboration is. Um, I also just want to make a quick side comment about, you know, what we were talking about accessibility. Uh, five years ago, I, I believe Juilliard uh, put in a requirement that e uh, every student has to put in um, or has to say a speech, a two minute, three minute speech to their audience for their graduation recital. And 
you know, watching people do this, it became apparent how so many of so many of us are so bad at it, yeah, <laughs> at talking to the public. How we're so comfortable with talking to each other uh, about music, but you know, talking to the general audience, yeah, we still have a lot more to learn. Um, so my next question for you guys is, what do you want your legacy in the arts to be? And Alternatively, do you want to have a legacy? For me, I I think like it tied for. I mean, I hope that it's not something that maybe is tied like all the way to to the arts. But I think what I wish for people to remember about me is um, like that I you know I loved what I did, poured everything into um, you know making doing the best that I could at whatever I was doing um, but also that was truly a good colleague and listener and I think that ties into how I want to be remembered like in my art form so um, just being able to just being a good collaborator but also just like doing doing what I loved um, and making that bringing joy to my community I think is what um, what I'd like to be remembered for both in the arts and just as a person in general. I don't know if I would want a legacy, but I do know what I'm passionate about and it's the arts as well as um, underprivileged children. Um, so maybe designing kind of a nonprofit for them because I feel like art is such a vital, we like, I think just human psyche, like we need art. It's a way, it's like an outlet. And for me growing up as I was labeled kind of like the extroverted introvert, like people think I'm out there, but like Art was really the one thing for me is how I could communicate to people because I'd always say I'm like I'm so bad with words like I just don't understand but like when I was sitting there and like my art classes or like working on a portfolio it's like that was my time to like decompress and I would spend hours just like painting um so I really think we need art to survive to like live and really fully like develop ourselves and I feel like if we have these underprivileged children who may not have those opportunities that other kids may have and we give them the art at a like that developing stage we can really produce like a, gr a I guess a good group of children who can go on to like leave in legacy so for me like I wouldn't want a legacy because I feel like nowadays you talk about founders of like nonprofits and like all the articles are about like how they grew up versus like actually what their nonprofit is still doing today so I'd want to make sure that if I do have a legacy like don't mention me you may not know my name but like mention what the nonprofit's doing for the kids um, yeah, I think mine is actually sort of in some ways similar to, to what Sydney just said. Um, in terms of education, we place such a high priority on uh, and such high value on people who are great educators of people mm -hmm. who are already really good at what they do. Um, in universities, conservatories, fine arts schools, everywhere. But there's so little value placed on people who are really, really good at teaching kids, um, mm -hmm. people who are really good at like lighting that fire and keeping it going, you know, when you're dealing with like seven year olds, uh, mm -hmm. and especially um, with 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 students, as Sydney said, who who probably are not going to have access to it otherwise. Um, so like really expanding that base um, and inspiring really young people, I think, is a great legacy to have. I thought about teaching a lot and thinking about all of the teachers I had in high school and early college that sparked that fire and encouraged me but also importantly like treated art as just as important as math or history or business or whatever I think that's so important as like I hate that question that parents ask I'm sure you guys have gotten it too when you're graduating with an art degree and so what are you gonna do with that and it's like what <laughs> are you gonna pass that to like a finance major or like it's just assumed that they're going to make a living and have a comfortable life whereas us it's like so what are you gonna how are you gonna make that work <laughs> so i don't know i i think it's important to not treat these things like hobbies or interests but to value them on the same plane as other careers it is a uh, drawing from the you know from what we've been talking about uh with educators you know as a violin instructor i think you know, what is you know very easy to uh you know, 
uh, to to miss, at least is that you know the you know the people that we teach are you know they're all human beings. <laughs> you know they're we're not trying to just simply make them you know, good at their instruments or good at a particular skill. Um, at least you know in you know my one on one interactions with students. You know you're you know sometimes you're also dealing with their you know life experiences and life situations. Um, yeah, you know, at the community college that I teach at, you know, uh, you know, whether or not they intend uh, to come with their you know life situations or not, you know, uh, my students sometimes have you you yeah have 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 problems where oh you I, I couldn't practice this week because you know my mom was in surgery uh, this whole time or you know and it's you know. Yeah, at at some point, uh, yeah, you're you're hired to you know uh, teach violin to make them you know you're more proficient at their instrument. But you know, you know, for you, know, uh, the reason why we got into the music music first place, you know, why we get into the arts in the first place is not to ah uh, to be the most you know virtuosic player ever. Is you know, yeah, we're dealing with humans, and I think you know, it's sometimes easy to lose sight of that. I think the reason I went into film music because I, I've i always felt like it is a great way to connect to people. Um, I am sure all of you guys have a film that you love growing up and maybe um, there's something about it that has changed your perspective on something or, you know, it entertains you, it comforts you and my dream is to be able to work on a film like that, that could, you know, bring joy and bring comfort to someone. And even if it's one person, I, I would be very happy about it. So now I want to ask you guys all, how can we help each other? One of the things that gets thrown around a lot is like sharing, like, for, you know, on what, what people are doing um, on social media, like sharing each other's concerts and everything, but I think that can go maybe a step further and really, like, I mean, for me, I know that I have, I don't often think about photography or, or design, um, and really, ed I can, I think, just speaking for myself, like, I can educate myself more on what different art form, like, what, what different artists and different formats are doing so that I can knowledgeably share their the specific art forms but then also just help support by them by using them in my you know designing programs that we have and just like so I think the first step is just educating myself on what everybody you know the the like really reading your and reading and taking in other art forms so that I can share with my community and we can all make each other stronger. I think also like being a sounding board for others if you're working on a project or just want to like talk out some ideas or something, I think that helps me the most when I'm working on something is to just lay it out there and let other people look at it or listen to it or whatever it is and just get their feedback and then take that and go develop it further. And I miss that a lot about school is just having that built in community of people ready to talk and help so maybe there's something that exists like that across different disciplines. And maybe it's more interesting to have musicians look at visual work and visual artists look at music or I don't know, could bring some cool new perspectives and new language. And I actually, I have, when I first met Dylan, I was like, you know, I think that we're pretty much the same person except I'm in music and you're in visual art and ever since then we have like I have texted her maybe six or seven times with random ideas on exhibits at museums um in story her, it was it's so fun. I love them I love getting those texts so I one do. of them was that we could have like visual artists come into a museum and sit down and listen to music by people who they they don't know what they look like and then draw them but just the idea of of like having the freedom to one connect with other people and have these relationships 
that are interdisciplinary. And then two, to feel like it's totally an okay and comfortable thing to be like, hey, I have this weird idea. What do you think? <laughs> yeah, I think we, uh, you know, we're, we're kind of afraid to have that kind of dialogue. Um, you know, uh, I think what Sydney was saying, how, you know, each of our different arts groups seem to have different agendas a lot of the times. I think, yeah, we, we, we're not even having, we don't even start that dialogue <laughs> with each other, I think, a lot of the times. Um, like, for example, um, I wish, you know, in my previous collaborations, you know, in Kinetic with, for example, a, a, the dance group, that I wish I said, oh, hi, you know, my name is Sam, nice to meet you. I wish I could, you know, kind of make those kind of baby steps in order to, you know, start something. <laughs> I, I, I love what you said, Sam. Um, and I've been in so many similar situations where we know that what we're doing uh, is, is interdisciplinary. You know, if you're playing a concert and there are dancers, or if you're doing an opera and there are dancers and there are lighting people and there are graphic designers and stage designers and set people, you know, but I just, you know, I never talk to those people. And uh, it's so bad, uh, it's so bad. I mean, I think one of the things surely that has happened because of the pandemic is has made us realize that like as a really broad artistic community, we're all the same um and has forced us to just have conversations that we would never have uh because that's all we can do is talk and i think that's great and i really hope that we all maintain that as we go back to our lives and like have that conversation with the costume designer you know and just like figure out what they're about um so i hope i hope that continues I really liked what uh dylan was saying that you know sometimes it's really helpful to have someone to give you feedback who isn't necessarily in the field, but they could maybe offer like a fresh perspective for what you're doing. And um, I always like collaborating with uh, people of other professions cause, because I've been doing a lot of theater work and now I'm usually working with filmmakers. And I think it's very interesting to have like a different perspective on how they see something. For example, when you work with a filmmaker, you, they, they focus so much on the storytelling and not necessarily the music. And sometimes, like, as musicians, we always like to talk in musical terms and that doesn't necessarily translate to someone who is in another field. But um, after all, we are all artists and we are all humans. We, we, we understand each, each other through emotions. And I've always found that, like, you know, as long as we are all doing art and we have um, the same, like we have the same emotions, we will be able to connect in some ways. Mm -hmm. And I really like Emma's idea of like being in like a gallery and, you know, I think that was like a perfect idea of like collaborations. And um, yeah, I think that would be like such a fun thing to do. Okay, so the way I think this is gonna work best is that I'm gonna post all these things in the chat. Boink. Um, and y'all are going to come up with some ideas of the projects that we can do together. And then we'll just bounce around and see what different ideas we can come up with that incorporate everyone in this chat into one big project. I don't know, like a mini opera kind of comes to mind. Um, I mean, I just, I just love the idea of art being created during music because I've I've seen things like that before and it's it just adds a different um element to listening to it kind of like you're listening both with your eyes and ears which is like which is pretty amazing and I mean opera is like that too but adding another element like painting or or designing uh, digitally um and of course with photography stills things like that no I just feel feel way out of my element talking about stuff like that, but just some things are coming, coming to mind. Kind of going off of that, I like the idea of like pairing sound with visual art or photography on the wall. I think when you're like planning an exhibition or thinking about how things are in a physical space, it's so much of that is like thinking about how the viewer is walking in and like their relationship to objects. And I know sculpture touches on this a lot more even than 
frames or photography, but I don't think we think that much about sound or acoustics in those spaces. And I think we should, I think that would add a whole another level and kind of like Poling was saying, like, you might not, it might not take over or be the main thing, but, but it will like augment your experience in some way. So I think is really cool. That actually remind me of uh, some exhibitions that I went to a while ago. And I remember um, they have like installations. I, I don't really know anything about contemporary art, but I remember that was an installation and they have like multiple speakers in a circle and it got, kind of like give you like a really cool sound design effect and kind of like a surround sound thing. And but that is like also like much of like lighting and image. And I thought that was like a really cool idea because usually traditionally when we go to a gallery, we would be thinking, oh, okay, I'm like just like being quiet. It's like almost like a library. You just go in and it's really quiet and then you focus so much on the visual side of it. But I think it would be really cool to also add like the audio element to it and have it to be merging with music and other other sound design things. And I think that would be really cool. I just had a, another idea. Um, I was definitely going in like the let's create an opera together direction. But now I'm thinking that we could we could the seven of us be like in a live exhibit in a museum and we could have Ben be like the conductor and then everyone who goes into the exhibit like picks a piece of paper that has a letter and a number on it and then Ben would conduct them and be like N7 go to the left and then they would be like in basically in our version of an opera they wouldn't have to sing um we could probably get a vocalist to be in the opera but like having you be a part of a live thing, like get on stage, but it's not instrumentalist. It's just people like walking around and then Ben telling them to do different things. I love that. I've always wanted to be yeah. like a bingo caller. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, love the, I love the idea of uh, like bringing whoever is there into the performance, into the art, into the installation. Um, and like the chance that comes with that and like you don't know how people are going to react to it are they going to like do what they're supposed to do or like be like I'm out of here you know? <laughs> <laughs> just yeah. now since Emma was talking about something interactive I'm thinking like what could we do during the pandemic because obviously we couldn't really go out right now but um, it reminds me of, uh, I don't know if you guys watch Black Mirror, there is a episode called Bandersnatch, which, oh, uh, yeah, the yeah, the, oh. yeah, 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 which the audience can like choose and pick uh, the plot yeah. and goes to a different ending, right? Yeah. And I'm thinking what if we have like kind of like a series of video, I haven't really thought about like exactly what to do, but what if like the, the audience can kind of like pick and choose what we are gonna do next? And, you know, maybe having like different endings to a story or something like that. I think that would be pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. That is really cool. I've been yeah. thinking about that a lot. Just like authorship and power between like, especially taking portraits. So much of that is like the photographer directing the model or whatever. But I love the idea of having the person or the viewer or whoever it is like having the authority and deciding things. Mm -hmm. What if we had, so interactive, I love that idea. I would also love to like troll the audience, um, but, in a, but in a nice way, not in a like, get out of here, you're not, a, you know, you're not in high art, more in a way of like, you wanna be a part of art? Like, here you go, here's the full experience. Um, and if we, like, even if we had, like, a Zoom session where anyone could, like, put in the chat or a Facebook Live where people could put in the chat what they wanted us to do. And then if someone put in something stupid, like, hop around in a circle on one foot, you could be like, okay, well, I'm not going to do that at, you know, whatever. And really, like, bring someone in. And then 
let's say we record it and rebroadcast it, then that person is permanently part of this like art installation that we've made. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's post, post, post modern. <laughs> I like that. I think that this is such a great group of people and we are so multifaceted um, in terms of like how we were raised and our art form and where we are and where we want to go. Um, and I think that this is just like a super great group of people who can like seriously make a difference in the arts world. So um, thank you guys all so much for being here. It's been so fun to talk to you and like get to know you guys better. And again, just feel free to like text each other if you want. Because now we all know each other and we could all collaborate on a cool project. Yeah. Um, definitely. Cool. Thank you for organizing this. Yeah, thanks so much, Emma. Thank you guys for being a part of it. Have a great day. Bye. 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 Bye.